a group of us got together and, and created this forum because uh, for two main reasons. Uh, one was that, as we all contemplate alternatives to empire and the law of might makes right, uh, we'd like a world where people are treated fairly and justly and equally. And one of the possibilities for that set of rules is uh, international law, which admittedly has been crafted by uh, many empires and those in power. But more and more often now, it's being crafted by an assembly of nations, not just the most powerful nations. And also, uh, it's getting input from grassroots groups, non-governmental organizations. And there is a, a new human rights ethic that is informing more and more international law. So it seems as if one of our best chances for having one standard for everyone is international law, which is developing, so we can still change it. Uh, there's always been a concern that international law it has a cultural bias, a Western cultural bias, uh, which is a concern and we should watch out for that. However, if you look around the world, you'll see that there are some basic human rights standards that all cultures share. I don't know of any culture where torture is all right. I know a lot of cultures where torture is done, but it's always hushed up and denied. Uh, so that, for instance, is a universal standard. Another reason that we got together and decided to try to educate ourselves on international law is that many human rights activists, especially after September 11th, uh, have been saying, well, there ought to be a law against what we're doing uh, to people in Afghanistan or to people in Iraq or what we're doing to people around the world. And what we found out when we explored this is there are laws about a lot of this. We just need to get more informed about them. And once we get informed about them, we can educate our friends, our community, and then we can start to pressure our government uh, to follow those laws and hold them accountable when they don't follow those laws. And so that's why uh, one of the reasons that we organized this uh, presentation this way was having our education first and then getting together as activists afterwards at the reception uh, and getting to know each other more, talking about what we've learned, maybe uh, taking some more steps, figuring out how we can actually implement some of what we've learned tonight to hold our government more accountable for what it's doing. Um, I have spent time working in the West Bank of uh, the occupied Palestinian territories as a human rights lawyer and when I was there in 1992 or 1993 uh, a woman walked into the office of the human rights organization where I worked, Al Haq, and she introduced herself as Judy Chomsky I said interesting name, I believe she's the sister-in-law, is that right? Yes. Uh, and she was working on a case uh, she was working with the Center for Constitutional Rights and working on a case against a company in Pennsylvania who manufactured tear gas that was then being sold to the Israeli army and used by Israeli occupation soldiers to tear gas Palestinian civilians um, and other civilians who happened to live in those areas, including me, on pretty much of a daily basis. You would find these tear gas canisters, uh, I, forget, I forget if it said CSX or CSR, whatever the gas was, and then made in Pennsylvania. So the Center for Constitutional Rights, uh, the first time I heard of them, was working on that case, trying to hold a company in the United States liable uh, for, want baby, uh, liable for its human rights abuses or the, the human rights abuses of its product when it got uh, sold to other people. Uh, the Center for Constitutional Rights was founded in the 1960s by attorneys who had been helping civil rights activists in Mississippi uh, defend themselves. And uh, Stephen may be able to tell you more about CCR, uh, but my understanding is that they were formed to litigate uh, cases and issues to promote uh, positive steps towards social justice. Stephen Watt, who will be talking in just a minute, uh, began as a tax attorney in Scotland, which uh, he's allowed is slowly gaining its independence. And from there, he worked in Africa uh, after the genocide in Rwanda. He worked in Rwanda, Tanzania, and Uganda uh, in relief and development. He spent three years in the Solomon Islands 
working for the government, but as he described it, often suing the government, as well as logging and mining companies, uh, and focusing on civil and human rights law. Uh, he received a master's in law, an LLM, from Notre Dame University in Indiana, and he currently works at the Center for Constitutional Rights, specializing in international human rights and humanitarian law. And what's going to happen is Stephen's going to talk for um, about 20 minutes to half an hour, and then he wanted to allow a long period of time for question and answer so that all of your burning questions will get answered. And at about uh, 8.30, we'll adjourn, well, we'll have a little bit of talking and then we'll adjourn to the reception where we want to see all of your smiling faces. So here's Stephen. Not get any um, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Um, and thank you all for turning out tonight. Um, I've, never, I've spoken quite a bit um, about the center's work, but never in so grand a hall as this. Um, and I've never been to Seattle. Um, and it was a great delight to me to get the very kind in invitation. Um, I'd also like to thank the sponsors of tonight's evening, and in particular I'd like to thank Carla for actually physically getting me here and picking me up at the airport yesterday and ensuring that I arrived at tonight's event. Um, as Linda said, um, I'd like to speak for 20, 25 minutes, half an hour. Um, I have a tendency to go on, um, so it may go on a bit longer. Um, but please stop me if you feel I've done too much. Um, and then at, at the end, I'd like to, I'd, I'd be very happy to answer questions on any of the issues that I've uh, raised in the course of this talk, or for that matter, on any other issues that you think I may be able to give some lucid answer. Um, so uh, Linda described a little bit about what the Center for Constitutional Rights is. Um, we are a, a legal organization, legal not-for-profit organization, so we're kind of like a law firm that doesn't make any money. Um, but what we do is, is we take cases that advance um, principles in the Constitution, and also at the forefront of our work, um, we introduce um, litigation which advances uh, not only constitutional rights, but international human rights and international humanitarian law standards. Um, my role, as, as Linda explained, my specialty is in international law and in particular international human rights and humanitarian law. Um, I came to the center at the end of 2001, in November 2001, and it was actually just two days after uh, President Bush had issued a military order establishing military commissions and also authorizing the indefinite detention of foreign nationals who he deems to be members of Al-Qaeda or Taliban. Uh, my first meeting at the center was discussing what is the legal status of individuals picked up in the course of the armed conflict, the ongoing armed conflict then in Afghanistan, and you know, can we challenge this um, in, in court? Um, so let me just clarify, CCR's, um, CCR's role in its September the 11th litigation. Um, our, our position is that this country and this government has has the right to investigate um, and to bring to justice the perpetrators of those heinous acts that were September the 11th, the attacks on New York and Washington DC. Um, but what they should be doing is carrying out these investigations in accordance with the rule of law um, and in particular um, to respect fundamental rights in those investigations. Fundamental rights such as the right to be free from arbitrary detention, such as the right to be free from torture. And what we've seen and what we've witnessed over the last two and a half years is that the United States government, the Bush administration, is simply not doing this. It's got a scorched earth policy to counter terrorism. It's not only illegal, it's immoral, and not only that, we believe firmly that it's not effective and it's really going to make us, at the end of the day, all a lot less safe. Um, so 
for tonight's talk, uh, what I'd like to do is bring home to you um, the human toll of the Bush administration's practices and policies in um, its counter-terrorism operations. And to do this, I'd like to take you very briefly through some of the many cases that CCR has filed challenging Bush administration practices and policies, and to highlight for you um, the suffering that um, plaintiffs sent the CCR's clients have suffered as a consequence of those unlawful practices. And really, I, I think you'll be quite horrified by what's going on, and this is what these cases serve to do, to highlight that. And what I'd like you to take from this is um, an understanding of what's going on, and I'd like you to, to go out and speak with your other friends and colleagues and tell them um, a little bit about um, what this administration is doing um, supposedly in the name of national security, supposedly in the name of making us all um, safer. So let's start here in the United States and let's go back to September the 11th and the immediate aftermath. Um, Mr. Abraham Turkman, on October the 18th, 2001, he had a visit by the FBI and he was arrested in New Jersey. He was arrested at his home and he was informally accused of being a member of Al-Qaeda and he was accused of being a close associate of Osama bin Laden, neither of which were true and no formal charges were leveled against him. Um, a year prior to this, Ibrahim had come to the United States, as many others before him have, and as many others do today. Um, he'd come on a tourist visa, six-month tourist visa. He'd overstayed that visa, and therefore he was out of status for immigration purposes. Um, he took a job. He was uh, working as uh, a garage attendant, and he also worked some construction. And the bulk of his money he was just sending back to his wife and kids in Turkey. Um, after his arrest, he was put into immigration proceedings and he accepted an order of the judge shortly thereafter to leave the country voluntarily. Um, a close friend of his purchased a ticket for him, came to the detention facility, um, gave the um, authorities in charge there that ticket and um, Abraham was ready to go home. But he then languished in Passaic Detention Facility, which I've had the misfortune of visiting on numerous occasions for three and a half months. He was cut off from his lawyer. He was cut off from his family. He was very seldom allowed to send letters out. And the reason for that was not because the INS, the immigration services, were having difficulties in arranging to send him back to Turkey. It wasn't because he was being investigated for criminal activity. It was simply because the FBI were holding him so that they could clear him of any involvement in terrorist activity. Um, what they'd done, effectively, is turn a fundamental principle of criminal justice on its head. They presumed him guilty until they had shown him to be innocent. Um, this similar process happened to a Canadian citizen of Pakistani descent, Shakir Balosh. Um, he, however, was detained in the Metropolitan Detention Centre in Brooklyn for some seven and a half months after he had an order from a judge to be deported. They could have sent him the next day back to Canada and instead they detained him in this foul facility for seven and a half months, cut off from his family, cut off from his lawyers, and he was Shakir was horribly abused by his, his captors for that seven and a half months. Um, Ibrahim and Shakir I've met with. I met with Ibrahim in Turkey and I met with Shakir on um, three occasions. I've met with, I met with him first in Geneva when he gave testimony about his treatment before the um, Human Rights Commission and then I met with him twice in Canada. I mean these guys are just, you know, they're, they're friends. Um, Okay, we can't identify terrorists easily, but you know, they're, they're as close to terrorists as you and I. And they weren't alone. They were among thousands that were rounded up in the tri-state area in a dragnet operation um, conducted by the FBI and the INS. They were arrested for minor immigration violations. They weren't arrested on 
uh, because they were suspected of involvement in crimes. It was simply because they'd overstayed their visa, or if they were students, they hadn't taken the requisite number of credit. Um, and that put them out of status, and that put them subject to detention in these facilities. Many of them were taken away in the middle of the night. Many of them were taken away um, from their jobs in the middle of the day. No notice to their families, no notice to their friends. The United States authorities simply disappeared them. This was like the practice of the authoritarian regimes um, that ran many of the countries in Latin America in the 80s. They the United States government disappeared people. They didn't allow them access to lawyers. They didn't allow them access to consular um, assistance. They were gone for all intents and purposes. Inside these facilities, they were horribly abused. Um, um, Asif Safi, um, a French citizen um, who, who CCR met whilst inside, all five foot four of him, he was slammed up against a wall on numerous occasions. He, was, he had his front teeth knocked out. And these are just some of the examples of abuse that happened to these immigrants whilst they were detained in facilities in this country, in the United States, under the glare of um, uh, news media, newspapers and the courts. Um, they were beaten, deprived of food, deprived of sleep, verbally assaulted, um, they were shackled, they were put in prolonged um, solitary confinement, and none of them were criminals. None of them were criminals. Um, CCR in April of 2002, we filed a lawsuit on their behalf. Um, we challenged uh, the procedure of holding people until cre cleared, so essentially preventative detention. Uh, we challenged their treatment as being cruel, inhuman and degrading. That's not only a violation of domestic law, that's a violation of international standards, standards recognised by the international community. At the time we filed this lawsuit, uh, very few people actually believed um, the allegations we made. They said, this is the United States, this doesn't happen here. Um, we know that it did, and that's why we filed the lawsuit. Um, and then, a year later, after we filed that lawsuit, lo and behold, the Office of the Inspector General of the Department of Justice issued an incredible 350-page report on the treatment of immigrants post 9-11, and they substantiated every one of the allegations we made, and more. They uh, got access to videos, video evidence which showed US officials, prison wardens, slamming people up against walls um, until blood ran from them. One horrible picture that is in this report, and I would encourage you to read it if you, if you want some more of the, these horrible, gruesome details, there was a t-shirt pinned to the wall of the Metropolitan Detention Center with those colors don't run, these colors don't run, and there was blood all the way down that. That is like a detention facility that I saw in Africa. That is not a detention facility that we should see in this country, and yet here it was happening on our very doorstep. Ashcroft, our Attorney General, he justified the treatment, he justified arbitrary detention, he justified mistreatment, and he said, he was keeping us safe and he would use whatever tools were within his power to do that. But statistics available, which the government grudgingly revealed, um, they don't bear this out. This dragnet did not keep us safe. Of the 1,200 that the government admits to having arrested, not one, not one was charged with a criminal offence related to terrorism. And the effect on the Muslim community in the tri-state area, they alienated that community from law enforcement officers. They deprived law enforcement officers of a potentially valuable source of information in the war against terrorism. And not only that, they really um, destroyed the Pakistani and South Asian community, um, the, the economy. Thousands, and I'm not joking, thousands of people left Green card holders, citizens of Pakistani, South Asian descent, left the United States because they feared that they too would be subject to such treatment. Um, uh, there's one street, there's Coney Island Avenue in New York. Um, 
I can count the number of shops and stores that have uh, closed down as a consequence of people just upping and leaving because they were fearful of remaining in this country. Now, this policy and practice of arbitrary detention and racial profiling that we saw on our doorstep, um, that wasn't restricted to uh, the United States. Um, after the first bomb started to fall on Afghanistan around October the 7th, 2001, um, the United States military and the intelligence services in this country started rounding up suspected, and I repeat, suspected members of Taliban and Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, but not only in Afghanistan, in other parts of the world, um, in Europe, um, in Africa. They started rounding them up and detaining them. And clearly, they were not all taken from the battlefield. That is a fact. Um, as I said, they were taken from other parts of the world. They weren't all people who sub should be subjected to the laws of war or international humanitarian law or the Geneva Conventions. And then the government started to think, well, what are we going to do with these people? We want to detain them and we want to get information from them. But we really don't want to give them any protections of international law. We don't want to give them any protections of the Constitution. And legal memoranda, which were, um, you may be aware of, were um, released uh, in the wake of the Abu Ghraib prison scandal, they reveal that this administration made a conscious decision to hold these people outside the law, devoid of all protections of the Geneva Conventions and of the Constitution. They would be extra-legal people. And they would hold them in facilities um, at Bagram Air Force Base. And then they decided, well, let's hold some of them closer to home. And they created a prison beyond the law. Well, they thought it was a prison beyond the law in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. And over two years um, from uh, those bombs first falling, they have transported up to about seven, seven to 800 people. We're not sure of the exact figures because only the government knows that. But some seven to 800 people have been removed to Guantanamo Bay in Cuba. And Others are held at other secret locations elsewhere. I mentioned Bagram. We also know potentially of Diego Garcia, which is a tiny little island in the Indian Ocean. And then there's other facilities in Afghanistan, Jordan, um, that we hear about in the press, but we don't really know. Um, and they're held there as extra legal people. They're held outside the law. Um, in January of 2002, uh, the United States government transported the first 34 detainees that it had picked up uh, we believe in Afghanistan, to Guantanamo Bay in Cuba and to a makeshift camp, um, to a collection of uh, metal cages um, on the Cuba naval base um, called Camp X-ray. And amongst those 34 were three of the center's clients, an um, uh, Australian citizen by the name of David Hicks, who was picked up in Afghanistan, and two English lads, Shafiq Rasul and Asif Iqbal, who were picked up um, in Pakistan. So, so what is Guantanamo? Now, I know I've been living, eating, breathing Guantanamo uh, for the last two and a half years, so I'm wholly familiar with what Guantanamo is and its prison beyond the law status. Um, but many people here in the United States just don't know. You know, you ask them and they think it's somewhere in Iraq and that it's all Iraqi citizens that are held there. And that's a fact. I mean, I have asked those questions of people and they just know nothing about what this government is doing and even where Guantanamo is. Um, it's, it's located on Cuba. It's a naval base. Um, it's, not, it's a considerable size. I mean, it's twice the size of Manhattan. Um, it's held on a lease from the Cuban government. And it's a very unusual lease because it vests ultimate sovereignty, what it calls ultimate sovereignty in the Cuban government, um, but it gives exclusive jurisdiction and control of, over the base to the United States government for its duration. And that lease goes on in perpetuity until both parties, both Cuba and the United States, say, we don't want to be here anymore. And that just isn't going to happen. Um, so the United States is effectively a territory of the United States. Um, the detainees, who are they? Um, as I said, about 700 or so uh, from 42 nations around the world. All of them are Muslim. 
Um, some as young as 13 to 15 years of age have been detained there over time. Some as old as 70 or 80. Uh, one CIA officer who visited there um, in 2002 met two senile old men. That's who he described as um, uh, two of the detainees there. Um, since detentions began there, some 150 have been released. Um, and the government has just arbitrarily released them, say that they're no further security threat to the United States, um, and they have no, uh, the United States is no further use to them, so it just discards them back to Afghanistan or Pakistan. Um, the government's position um, has been that the Geneva Conventions don't apply and that all of them are so-called enemy combatants. Now, as used by the government, there is no definition under either domestic law or international law of an enemy combatant. That is a creation, a fabrication of the United States government. That from the Bush administration down, they've been condemned from the very beginning as the worst of the worst, hardened criminals, terrorists. So in the same way as US authorities um, turned criminal justice on its head in this country, it has done in Guantanamo. They're all presumed guilty until they have an opportunity to, to, to prove themselves innocent. Uh, the government says that no court can review what they do down there. It can't look at it. It can't, courts cannot challenge, uh, these individuals can't come to court to challenge their detention. Um, they can't go there to challenge anything the United States authorities do to them down there. Um, and also the government claims that it can hold them until the end of the war against terrorism. Now, when's that? Um, that's of indefinite duration. Um, now, we entered, the Centre for Constitutional Rights entered the fray very early on. We filed um, legal proceedings on behalf of the three guys that I mentioned earlier um, in February of 2002. And we had a real uphill struggle. Um, in the district court, um, the judge hardly looked at us in throwing the case out. And then in the DC um, uh, Circuit Court of Appeals, they upheld the government's position that this government could create a prison beyond the law. And let's analyze the position taken by the courts, just, just slightly, we'll scrape the surface of it. Here, here's what the position is. The United States military could fly up to Toronto tomorrow. They could pick a Canadian citizen off the street designate him an enemy combatant, hold him in Guantanamo. Not only hold him in Guantanamo, they could torture him, they could summarily execute him, and they would say, the US courts can do nothing. He has no right to get his foot in the door of a US court. That is an incredibly extreme position. But that is what was upheld by the courts in this country until the Supreme Court took a hold of the case, saw the government's position for what it was, and found that detainees at Guantanamo did have a right to come before United States courts to challenge their detention. So since then, um, CCR has been coordinating. Uh, we've, we have had an incredible response from law firms around um, the country, big international law firms that wouldn't come anywhere near us in February of 2002. Um, to take cases on behalf and to uphold the principle that everyone should have a right to challenge their detention at the hands of the United States government. Um, we've filed now petitions on behalf of 73 individuals and we'd like to file on behalf of every single one of them but we just cannot get access to their families. Um, and that's what we're attempting to do now, is to bring some modicum of justice to individuals that have been detained there, some for up to three years now, under atrocious conditions. Thank you. Um, the government, amazingly, actually nothing amazes me with this administration, including their lawyers they're still taking this ridiculous position that the detainees down there have no rights. Um, so we can't get, we have no right of access to them. They have a right to come to court, but we can't access them. And the government is dragging its heels at every opportunity. But now the courts have turned the corner. The judges are getting really angry with the government's position. And that I see is, is a good thing. I think there is a section of, um, of this community, and all of you here are a testament to that, that, that are really challenging the government um, for what it's standing for. 
But I think it's going to be some time until these detainees at Guantanamo, all 595 of them, see some form of justice. Now, not only is the government arbitrarily detaining individuals in this war against terrorism, it's doing something worse still. Um, since uh, 2002, and I've been, I've had my, I've been looking at the papers, uh, Washington Post, New York Times, you know, since arriving at CCR. That's where I get most of my information from because you don't get nothing from this administration. Um, but there have been reports coming in, filtering through, of mistreatment of detainees in Afghanistan and, to a lesser extent, Guantanamo. And some of those stories were here for the whole of the United States to see. I mean, who remembers the American Taliban, John Walker Lind? John Walker Lind was picked up in Afghanistan, and there was pictures in the New York Post, and I, I remember them vividly, and the New York, was it Daily News, the, you know, the two tabloids there. Front page of John Walker Lind, an American citizen, hogtied to a stretcher, naked, duct taped to his eyes, duct taped to his mouth, um, and he, you didn't know this, but you learn this in, uh, in, the, in his, later in his court proceeding, he actually had a bullet in his leg at that point, and the US authorities, the military that held him, wouldn't take it out. They denied him medical treatment um, at the time because they wanted to get information from him. That was an American citizen, so you can only imagine what was going on to, um, with Afghanis, Pakistanis, and other nationals that had been detained by the US military at that point. The Washington Post, in a, an incredible article on the 26th of December 2002 um, by Dana Priest, and I would encourage you to read that one too, um, she interviewed, um, a, a, actually a team of journalists interviewed US officials in Guantanamo, not in Guantanamo, in Afghanistan rather, and they openly discussed the use of what they called stress and duress techniques on detainees. And this was like hooding, uh, prolonged solitary confinement, beatings, uh, holding in awkward positions, subjection to extremes of temperature, heat and light. Um, and they talked about using them and, and they talked openly about it and that in layman's terms is torture, that in layman's terms is cruel, inhuman and degrading treatment. And yet that was being sanctioned. Um, now in March of 2004 of this year, I had the great privilege of meeting with three of our clients um, who had been detained at Guantanamo Bay, Shafiq Rasul and Asi Vikbal and their friend Rahul Ahmed. Um, three like ordinary lads, like they're now uh, 22, 23 years of age, picked up when they were 19. And they described to me their treatment at the hands of uh, US captors in uh, Afghanistan and then in Guantanamo for two and a half years. And it really left me thinking, I mean, what have we become that we can do this to three human beings? Um, I was, it was really upsetting to hear what they had been subjected to. Um, they had been beaten, uh, they had guns to their heads, um, they had been sexually humiliated, they had their religion ridiculed, uh, they had unmuzzled dogs at their throats by US officials, by US prison wardens. Uh, it, it really is, you know, I read about it, but then you meet three people that have been subjected to it. It, it really brings it home. It's, it's really inhuman. And this has been done in the name of America. Um, the legal memoranda that were leaked, they all showed that these techniques that these three boys, and that's what they are, they're boys, had been subjected to, um, had the approval of Rumsfeld and President Bush. They said that that was okay. And not only did these memoranda say that that was okay, they also approved some more egregious techniques, one of which is called waterboarding. And what that is, is faking somebody's drowning, putting them in a, a pool, a tank of water, holding them under, under the water until they thought they were drowning. And that's a technique approved by this government in the interrogation of suspects. They're, they're not criminal. They haven't been criminally convicted, they're suspects. And our three guys, Shafiq, Asif, and Rahul, were released. 
back to their country after two and a half years. And when they arrived back in the UK, the UK government officials held them for all of three hours and then released them back to their families. And this government hasn't even so much as apologised to them yet. And also in those memoranda, Bush advances this incredible position that as commander-in-chief of the armed forces of this country, he can do whatever he pleases. He has carte blanche to do whatever he chooses to any human being he comes across, um, including torture. That's really quite an extraordinary position to take. Now I'd like to discuss, this is torture by another name. Um, and this is a policy and practice which some of you here will not have heard about. Um, and I was speaking to Carl and Tom about it and uh, they were sort of gobsmacked when um, I discussed this particular technique. Um, it's, it's not torture at the hands of US officials, rather it's farming out torture. And the Bush administration has coined another euphemistic term for an outrageous practice and it's called extraordinary rendition. And what it is, is the United States picks up somebody, usually a low-level suspect, somebody who they can't get any information from using uh, humane interrogation techniques. So what they do is they ship them off to Syria, Jordan, or Egypt, countries which this country knows practice as torture. And they do that with the intention that they be interrogated under torture. And this government shares information with the country who's carrying out the torture and humane treatment to see if they can get anything from them. And that's called extraordinary rendition. Now, that may sound very Orwellian to you, and you may think, well, Stephen's going a bit off the charts here, but um, George Tennant recently, the former CIA director before the 9-11 Commission of Inquiry, gave testimony to the effect that extraordinary rendition was a key counter-terrorism policy employed by the United States government, had been for a number of years, and it had racked up many successes in the, in the, the fight against terrorism. Um, and they claimed that they'd rounded up 70 individuals pre-September the 11th um, and sent them off to torture in other countries. Most of these have happened outside the country. Uh, two of our clients were uh, rendered from Gambia. They're Jamil Elbana and Bishar Al Rawi, long term British residents. Um, they're businessmen. They travelled from the UK to um, Gambia in Africa. And they were picked up at the airport by um, Gambian security forces. These guys have been going back and forth to the UK and Gambia for a number of years. They've been setting up a peanut processing plant there. Um, but this, on this occasion, the uh, Gambian officials shortly handed them over to CIA officials. And the CIA officials then held them in an unknown location, shipped them off to uh, Bagram Air Force Base, and then stuck them in Guantanamo Bay, and they're, they're there to this day. Um, the United States also at the end of 2001, uh, officials, we don't know from the CIA, some intelligence service, they traveled to Sweden, uh, they picked up two Swedish asylum seekers there of Egyptian descent, they should put them on a plane and they flew them to Egypt where they were horribly tortured. The Swedish authorities are carrying out a full public inquiry into this. The United States just denies any knowledge of it. And then we have the case of Maher Arar, another client of the Center for Constitutional Rights. Um, Maher was traveling through JFK Airport. He's a Canadian citizen, Syrian descent. And he was traveling through JFK Airport on his way home to Canada after a family holiday. He's got a wife and two kids. Um, he was pulled aside at customs. Um, he thought, well, you know, this is September the 11th. I'm a Muslim man. Um, I'm going to get asked questions. But then after six hours of intensive interrogation, he thought something's going awry here. I need a lawyer. They wouldn't give him a lawyer. He asked for his consular official to see his consular services in New York. They wouldn't allow him that. It was five days of detention before he got to make a phone call home. And seven days later, in the middle of the night, in the early hours of the morning, in fact, a Sunday morning, he was uh, driven through Manhattan to a private airfield in New Jersey. He was put on a plane and he was flown to Jordan 
and in Jordan, the US officials handed him over to um, Jordanian security service who beat the hell out of him for 10 hours as they drove through the desert to Syria and they handed him over to the Syrians. Maher had not been in Syria since he was 17 years of age. He's now 34. No connection with Syria whatsoever. His home is Canada. Um, I, I, I still, like, when I recount this, I just think this is incredible, and I can't believe I'm actually telling this, this story, but this really happened to uh, Maher. Um, in Syria, for two weeks, he was disappeared. The United States, despite our asking them, where is this person? He was in your hands last. You must know where he is. For two weeks, they denied all knowledge of Maher until the Syrian government eventually admitted to the Canadian government through the embassies in Damascus that Maher was with them, delivered to them by the United States. And during that two weeks, he was disappeared. Maher was beaten severely with an electric cable on all parts of his body. And he was then housed in what he describes as his grave. It was a cell which was little wider than he is, about three foot wide. It was about six foot long and it was six foot high. And that was his home for uh, close to a year. And he was subjected to interrogations. He was subjected to torture. He heard the screams of other people in that facility being tortured. And the United States knew that that would happen because if you go and read the Department of State's human rights reports for Syria for at least the last 10 years of high da as I have done, they will describe to you in excruciating detail that security services in Syria torture people. The United States knew that would happen to Maher and that's why they sent him. And 60 Minutes 2, we got them involved. They did a, Ma Maher was eventually released after a year back to Canada and they released him because he, they could find nothing on him. The Syrians released him back an innocent man and Canada accepted him back innocent. The Syrian ambassador in Washington to, in a 60 Minutes interview said that throughout Maher's time in Syria they were communicating with United States authority, their counterparts, and they gave him a whole dossier on Maher after they finished with him. And the United States, they said, benefited from that information, but they didn't give they didn't give the United States anything because the Syrians conducted a year-long investigation, even using torture, and couldn't find one shred of evidence that connected Maher to terrorists or terrorist-related activity. Um, the United States um, have, in, in its only published statement, John Ashcroft said that what they did was in accordance with um, their obligations under domestic law and under international law. That, quite frankly, is a bold-faced lie because this country is a party to the Convention Against Torture and Article 3 of that convention provides that this country shall not send persons to country where there's a substantial likelihood of their being subjected to torture. And not only has the United States signed the Convention Against Torture, it's actually incorporated that particular provision in an act of Congress. That is the policy, it's the policy of the United States not to do what they did. And then Ashcroft has the temerity to stand up and say they did nothing wrong. Maher is an incredible individual. Uh, I've met with him numerous occasions. I speak with him every week. He's a family man. He has a wife and two little kids. His youngest, he you know, was just born shortly before he was subjected to his year in hell. Um, hardly knew him when he came back. Maher is really shattered by his whole experience. Um, he was a very highly respected um, computer consultant um, before the United States destroyed him. Um, and he hasn't been able to work since, understandably. And he just wants to get to the bottom of why this happened to him. He wants to make sure this doesn't happen to other people, because it could very well happen to others. Um, Canada has taken responsibility. It believes there, there is possibility that you, uh, Canadian officials were involved in some way, shape or form. Um, and they're carrying out full public inquiry. And again, in the, case of, as in the case of the Sweden renditions, the United States just says, we don't know anything. They're not going to do anything about it. Maher's only mistake was to be a Muslim man transiting through JFK airport. That's all I can find on him. 
Now, this type of, um, and I'm, I, I'm coming, I just want to sort of conclude by um, outlining for you some of my thoughts on counterterrorism and, and where we're going here in the United States. Um, the type of racial profiling that I've described to you um, and has been adopted by the United States in the post 9 11 era, and which has seen the roundup of immigrants in this country, seen the establishment of Guantanamo, and saw the rendition of Maher to um, Syria for torture, and which this country justifies in the name of national security. Sadly, it's not a new phenomenon. Um, and as far back as World War II, um, we saw this type of racial profiling happening in the name of counterterrorism or keeping us safer. Um, President Roosevelt, after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941, two months after that, he signed an executive order which saw the removal of some 120,000 Japanese uh, individuals of Japanese descent into internment camps in this country. Many of them were removed from this very state. Um, there was no charges leveled against them. They had no hearings. They, knew not, they didn't know why they were being transported to where they were being transported. And they were held there for three years. The Supreme Court of this country upheld their internment in a 6-3 decision. And since then, it's all been round, the, the internment of the Japanese has been roundly criticized as a grave mistake um, by Supreme Court justices sitting in the current Supreme Court. And in 1976, by President Ford, he offered a, an apology. And then in 1988, President Reagan said that um, it was a grave injustice and it was carried out without adequate security grounds. It was overreaching on the part of the administration. So as with the internments in 1942 and the arbitrary arrest and detention and torture and renditions that we're seeing in the name of counterterrorism, they're not, it's not making us any safer. And all it does is mark a black period in, or another black period in this country's history. And it shows that the Bush administration has really learned very little from history. The right to be free from arbitrary detention, the right to be free from torture, they're two of the most fundamental international human rights protections um, in the international community. Um, as Linda said, every country, even authoritarian regimes, at least on paper, disavow torture. Yet this country practices it and gives legal justifications for it. That's going to send a message. It sends a message to other less powerful countries that they can do precisely the same thing. And at the end of the day, that is going to cause untold harm, not only to the citizens of those countries, but also American citizens. And already you can see some concrete examples of this in process. Um, for example, take um, the, after the invasion of Iraq, the recent invasion in, of Iraq, um, some US troops were uh, captured as prisoners of war by the Iraqi troops, and they were paraded in front of cameras and humiliated. Rumsfeld's jumping up and down, shouting about violations of the Geneva Convention. But then, how ironic, a year to the day, Rumsfeld was parading Guantanamo Bay detainees before cameras of the international community. And in a much more humiliating fashion, they had goggles on, they had orange jumpsuits, they were kneeling on the ground, before US troops with guns in their hand. It was much more humiliating than um, the manner in which the Iraqi troops, were, the, the Iraqi troops had treated um, their US um, counterparts. It's also going to alienate um, this country from the rest of the world, the violation of these fundamental rights. Um, that's going to make it increasingly difficult, as we're seeing in Iraq, for this country to form those international coalitions that are crucial to solve some of the world's most pressing problems, and in particular the war against terrorism. Strong as this country is militarily, it ain't going to destroy terrorism by military might alone. It really needs the international community, and in particular those m m Muslim countries, to come on side. And that just isn't going to happen if international law is flouted at every opportunity, as it is being done by this administration. And these oppressive 
these oppressive measures that are taken, they're really going to serve as a recruiting tool for Al-Qaeda and other terrorist organizations. They're not going to lead to a reduction in the number of terrorists. They're not going to lead to a reduction in um, attacks on civilians. And history shows that this is true. Uh, and I can take, for example, um, my country. Um, in the UK in the 1970s, um, the United Kingdom in Northern Ireland introduced some of the most oppressive anti-terrorism legislation um, that, that, that my country has ever seen. And they also at the same time introduced um, procedures, interrogation procedures, which uh, mirror the same ones that this country is using now and call stress and duress. And that saw a swelling in the ranks of the IRA and it saw the greatest number of terrorist attacks um, or attacks against civilians that that decades long struggle has seen. We also look to um, France and its use of torture in its occupation of Algeria. That didn't see an end to um, attacks on civilians. It saw more attacks on civilians and eventually saw France withdraw entirely. And then look at Israel. All the military might of Israel um, against um, it, in the occupied territories, that's not led to a downturn in violence, it's, it's led to an upswing. And really to bring terrorism to an end, um, this country is going to have to be much more sophisticated in its approach. Um, bombs, arbitrary detention and torture, and victimization of Muslims, that just isn't going to carry. Um, and at a minimum, I haven't got the answers, but I think at a minimum, um, this approach, the approach to countering terrorism, it has to engender respect for the rule of law, and it has to respect basic rights, the right not to be arbitrarily detained, the right not to be tortured. And those rights have to extend to everyone, um, to citizens and non-citizens, and to Muslims and non-Muslims. And if that doesn't happen, I'm very pessimistic about um, the years ahead. And I've probably gone on longer than my 20, 25 minutes, um, but I'd be very happy to answer any questions that you have. And <laughs> so what you've asked is um, the issue of when did extraordinary rendition first come to light and whether um, it was a creation of the Bush administration or whether it actually predates him. Um, and then the second question uh, was, um, the issue, I keep forgetting second questions. Uh, enslavement of the planet is the ultimate goal. Yeah, are, are other governments engaging in similar such practices? Mm. Well, to answer your first question, extraordinary rendition, it's, it's really, again, another of those uh, practices that's shrouded in secrecy and you have to actually um, look through the lines. Um, I've done a bit of research on this and I've traced it back the term rendition back to um, Sandy Berger, who was um, Clinton's, um, one of Clinton's security advisors, I think. Um, and he coined the term first in a, it's 1998 and was used in relation to um, some renditions that occurred of, um, of individuals from Bosnia-Herzegovina to um, Egypt um, for torture in Egypt. Um, but it's really taken on a whole new face in, in under the Bush administration, but again, we really can't get to the bottom of it. Um, we really need to get um, some of these legal memoranda, I believe, the legal memoranda that haven't come to light yet, I think that they would shed some more light on it. Um, and to answer your um, other question about, um, this was more kind of a comment, I think, on your part, was it? Um, I think a lot of governments do act um, secretly, but there, we had an interesting discussion, Carla and myself and Tom, uh, later, and I think that, that the Bush administration, at least it's blatant about what it does. You know, it, it, it practices torture and it's, it calls it torture. Um, 
Whereas, you know, previous administrations have done things surreptitiously, uh, you know, and claim to be, uh, would claim to be better than the Bush administration, but I don't know if they were, you know. Um, I, don't, I don't know if that answers your question. But that, that is made up because the protections of the Geneva Conventions extend to, to everyone who is in detention. Some form of protection extends to them. And that's the interpretation of the International Committee of the Red Cross. Um, I was discussing this earlier about this, um, the term, the term the government uses, enemy combatant, that is a fabrication. There is, the manner in which they use it is, is just, there is no definition in the Geneva Conventions, for example. Um, and there is no definition under customary international law, the customary international laws of war. Um, but what there is, is uh, it's called um, unlawful belligerency, and it's when somebody takes part in hostilities um, when they don't have combatant status, so they're like a civilian who engages in armed conflict. But those individuals, they're not devoid of any protections. They're still protected by um, fundamental rights recognized under the Geneva Conventions, for example, Common Article 3, which provides that they have a right to humane treatment, which provides that they should be free from torture, and if they're tried, that they should be subjected to a fair and impartial trial. So there is nobody in the Geneva Conventions that's devoid, that, there's nobody in time of war who's picked up and detained that is devoid of all protections as the Bush administration claims. That's nonsense. Um, so you're asking if there's any tort claims being brought against um, at, on behalf of any of those victims of 9-11 uh, policies. Well, in, in our lawsuits, um, the, the lawsuit on behalf of the immigrants uh, rounded up post 9-11, that's a tort suit. It's, like, it's, a Biv it's what's called a Bivens claim. It's like alleging violations of the Constitution on behalf of these individuals, and the relief there is damages. Uh, Mahar Arar's case, um, we filed um, suit on his behalf in the Eastern District of New York. Um, it's in, in Brooklyn. And we've got a very interesting claim, um, which I think the judge that has been assigned to that case is very interested in, because our lead claim in that case, um, and again, it's a damages case, um, is under the Torture Victim Protection Act. And the Torture Victim Protection Act provides that, um, it, it provides for a cause of action uh, for, for damages on behalf of US and non-US citizens who have been subjected to torture under color of foreign law. So our claim there is that the United States in knowingly sending Maher to torture in a country um, such as Syria, which they know practices torture, they aided and abetted in his torture and therefore they should be found liable under the Torture Victim Protection Act and they should um, provide damages. But damages in, in Maher's case is really not his primary motivation. He really wants to clear his name. Um, but at the end of the day, as I said to Maher, you lost a year of your life. You're entitled to compensation.